Uh, it's an AT&T 5G call to the field, and we are calling Felipe Cardenas of The Athletic because he is very busy, and we are not the only ones, I assume, calling you, Felipe. How has your week been, man? Calm, chill, really relaxed? Oh, yeah. Yeah, just normal work week for me, of course. No, it's been wild. It's been crazy. I think it's been – anyone that's in Atlanta has been doing a lot of work. Uh, clearly, as you guys know, like uh, ever since really the, the Joseph Martinez thing started happening with Gabriel Heinz, I've been on top of it and I don't think that's I don't think the story has ended quite yet, to be honest with you guys. All right. So how did this story start? Let's let's begin there for you. When did you start getting an inkling that something was off in Five Stripes world? Because from my perspective, at least this seemed to happen pretty darn quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think when I go back, I do the timeline. I I, I I point to July 6th when it was the first time that Gabriel Heinze publicly told us uh, that Joseph Martinez was training separate separate from the team. And so at the first, I, I admit, like, I think all of us assume that he was coming back into fitness after uh, World Cup qualifying and, and having to have gone through COVID in Brazil during the Cup America. Uh, but from then, like that's when my sources started to kind of contact me and I started to kind of look into what was happening with Joseph because he wasn't back. And and now in hindsight, when we would ask players during availabilities, like, what's this going to be like when Joseph comes back? Are you guys anxious? Like they would literally like not know how to answer. And it's because I don't think they knew what was going on. And, and that seemed to have been intentional on Gabriel Heinz's part. And so then I realized uh, through sources that, Joseph Martinez had been medically cleared to play about five days after returning from Copa America. So clearly this was not a fitness issue. Uh, and, and, you know, then when we, the next time we got Gabriel Heinze, I just, I had to ask him straight up, like, what is going on with Joseph Martinez? And knowing that he's, you know, I, I think in the end, I, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what he was going to say, but now knowing him, Gabriel Heinze, he's very transparent and was just blunt. He's like, it's a coach's decision. It's not, has nothing to do with fitness and he has his reasons and he wouldn't elaborate. And so that's when I knew something was going terribly wrong within Atlanta United. You have a new coach, a very strong-minded, uh, unorthodox sort of coach that has now in, is feuding with another strong, very strong personality and one of the best players that this league has seen and a team, you know, player that is beloved by the city, that is the, sort of like the fr- face of the franchise that drives a lot of money every to, to these weekly games, the merchandise. Like you just, it was like this problem that I saw happening. Uh, and, and that's when these problems really started up until the, the last game against New England on Saturday. That was the eighth game without a win for Atlanta United the next day. Gabriel Heinz, it was let go. Do we think if they had been winning, but Joseph was not training with the team and all this stuff was going on, that Gabriel Heinz would still be the manager? You know, I think it would have been perhaps more difficult for the club to to make this decision. Uh, you know, they, you know, Carlos Bocanegra, the technical director, and the president Darren Neils told us on on Sunday. Um, that it, it wasn't performance based, but even though they weren't winning games and they're tenth in, in in the East, they referred to it as a variety of issues that centered more around like leadership. Um, so that to me sounds like it's it's there's something else there. I mean, you know, through a lot of reporting, you know, through throughout the country, especially locally here, we know now that there was the, an MLSPA grievance filed. Uh, there were players that were they were overtraining. They were crossing the threshold of of the hours that were that are established to be able to train in preseason. It all happened really early. Like you know, we, we're here in July, but these things were happening months ago. Um, and so I think that was probably where the club was going as far as the decision to let this coach go. But I believe you know the Joseph thing didn't help. The losses don't help, uh, and the fact that you have a team that just didn't look good on game day like it just wasn't working really that the whole package how do they come to that moment because this is not you know this is not started july 6th this started basically years ago when tata left and frank DeBoer came in and that worked for a little while and then it didn't work and then he was gone and then we went through a whole coaching search and we were here with you talking through those candidates and the process and now we are here back again like how bad does it have to be for Atlanta United to can their new shiny, we did it, we got the right guy head coach 13 games into a season. Like we've heard all the stuff, you know, Doug McIntyre's reporting, your reporting all throughout about all the different things going on. 
how bad was it? I don't think we know yet, but it, but it's bad. It's not just on the coach. You know, there there are decision makers here that that are responsible. Like you said, they they set their sights on Gabriel Heinze, a six month courtship where he was the only candidate. They put everything in, you know, on Gabriel Heinze to be the coach that got them that would get them out of this funk from the twenty twenty season that was a disaster. They had to fire Frank DeBoer. They don't make the playoffs. The team just, just looks like a regular sort of run-of-the-mill MLS club coming from the Tata years. Now, you mentioned it, Andrew. It's like this is the first time they've had a, a coach that has hard training methods and who's had to uh, – that who was approached by players like, hey, we have a CBA. This is what we've fought for. Mm -hmm. That happened under Tata Martino. There was not a grievance filed from what my sources tell me. It was like more like a warning. But it was to the point where the players were concerned. And the club – you know, the union, the players, and Tata Martino dealt with it. You know, they had injuries, but they dealt with that. The coach adjusted. He had a staff that understood um, how to deal with this sort of situation, what battles to pick with players, with the front office, with with everything, you know, and it led to incredible success. And so the, the drop-off has been severe. And, you know, I think with hindsight, who was supposed to kind of bring back the glory. You know, I even wrote about that. Like, I, I felt like it was a great hire for MLS. I think now in, in, in hindsight, uh, my caveat throughout my reporting from the day he was announced was always like, will this work in this present moment for Atlanta United? Will, are they able to truly harness and manage a coach like this who has all of his mentors, uh, perhaps like flaws in, in, in Marcelo Bielsa? Um, he is that sort of coach um, as far as how he controls players psychologically, uh, how he manages club staff and how he takes over when he steps into a job. And so I don't think that was managed well internally, because if you're a sporting director and if you're a president, if you're making this hire, you need to be there day to day and be able to understand where this coach and his staff who are new to the country, new to the league may misstep may find their missteps and very interesting i felt after that loss to new england last saturday gabriel heinz when he was asked if he had the backing of the front office his answer was like i don't need their backing like they are alongside me every single day they see me work they've seen i told them what i was going to do um you know there weren't surprises and so i thought that was revealing i think i think it was sort of intentional on his part as well but there shouldn't have been you know this well, we didn't know what we were getting into. If you went down to Argentina, like Carlos Bocanegra said, you'd, I'm sure they told them, okay, this is what you're committing to. This sort of coach, this sort of personality, these demands, but this is these are the results that you may have, which in the last few years for Heinz have been pretty good. You, can, you cover the connection, the strongest uh, it's probably ever been between South America and MLS. Over the last few years, I'm just curious, is this an indictment right now at this time on Argentine managers in MLS, when you look at GBS last year, what happened with Heinze, I think different people have different opinions about how Matias Almeida is doing. And obviously he had the stop off in Chivas along the way. Um, do you, are these the, just individuals and they've each had their own moment because obviously their struggles are completely different in the way it's happened. Or do you see something bigger in managers coming from specifically Argentina to MLS? It's it's a good question. I think it's it's a valid debate. I don't think it's it should be down to nationality, though. You know, I think clearly because first of all, like the first, the most successful coach in Atlanta United history is an Argentine. Like I mentioned, his staff was made up of all Argentines, aside from the goalkeeper coach, who is now with the U.S. Men's National Team, Aaron Hyde. That was a very important hire as well. But that's what I'm saying. It was like they knew how to find that like right, the right formula. Um, so it's not so much the country i do think it's a cultural thing i think the fit has to be right you know the the project has to be right for these coaches like matias almeida you know is that the right project for him um you know we've been talking about that since he came in you know it's it's much different to be coaching at chivas than to be coaching at san jose um and and that goes down to not just like the the investment that you get at these clubs but like the talent that is available 
within the academies, the sort of players that you can, you know, cover band-aids, like wounds with band-aids. Oh, I need a youth player that's going to start. Great. I can go down and do that. That's what Heinze had at Vela's too. Oh, this player's hurt. I'll go down to the academy and I'm going to play an 18-year-old that can just rip it on the wings. You know, that's not the case in MLS, certainly not the case in Atlanta United. And so, yes, like the way I reported it recently, it's like maybe it puts a pause on going all in on an international manager, but only because Atlanta United is 13 games into a season. And if they're going to bring in an international manager, I think they need to, 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 to like package that deal differently and perhaps have assistants that, that understand the lead, that understand what it's going to take to get to the playoffs at this moment in time, uh, how to study the opponents. Like for Heinze, he said it himself. It was like every, he was learning about, you know, port, the Portland Timbers. He was learning about how to face the New England and Montreal. Like it was all sort of this thing that, but if you're committing to that, like that's because it was like a, a two year project. And so I don't think it's necessarily an indictment on South American coaches. I, I do think that there is something there about like, what does the word fit truly mean, honestly? And how do you support somebody once you once you bring them into your organization, perhaps? I want to get to you uh, on the process of all this, of the hire itself, but more importantly, the next hire and who might be targets for that, what the timeline might be. But I do have to ask you here, because, and I don't know if it's reporting or rumor mongering or just bad translations going back and forth. Of course, Heinz and his camp are going to come out and say, hey, this this didn't go down the right way. Are there two sides to this? Like, it seems in the reporting so far that it's been sort of, I don't know if one-sided is the right word. I'm not targeting, trying to target you or anybody else with that. I'm just saying that Heinz has sort of been portrayed as the bad guy. Yeah. Were there players that that truly supported him and believed him? Is there a large part of the squad that did? Like, was there a split within the team as it came to how they were managed and then this decision that was made by Atlanta United? Yeah, I mean, I think for my reporting and, and, and when I've been talking to sources this whole week, I think my my consensus is that it does seem like a little bit of a split down the middle as far as how that locker room viewed Gabriel Heinze. You know, it wasn't like it was a full on mutiny. Like, I don't I would not I don't think that's accurate at all. Uh, there were players that that supported him, you know, Brooks Lennon the, on, on, on Monday. Like, I think he gave this a quote that I include in the story, like he was surprised by the fire. He gave him, he gave Heinze like a lot of credit for having given him the, like more responsibility on this team. Like honestly, Brooks Lennon has been really good this year. You know, he might be the best player on this team. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with the sort of the, the individual coaching that he got from Gabriel Heinze. Uh, and, and so I also know from talking to sources that, yeah, other, other players were, had a difficult time, you know, adjusting to the training regimen, uh, I, I think sort of like the mental demands and, and also just tactically, it wasn't, it, it's sometimes, it's not fun to play that way. <laughs> sometimes when you're constantly like on an Island, you know, getting ripped to shreds up the middle, uh, you're, you're trying to man mark a guy. You had George Bellow playing as a left back. And sometimes he was on the opposite side of the field, chasing somebody. And just like, in the end, I was like, what are these guys doing? You know, like it wasn't, it wasn't cohesive. And that, that, I think that frustrates, honestly, like experienced players, you know, players that have been in on winning teams and they see the way this is going tactically. And they're like, you know, this is not working. And so I, it's not full on mutiny. I think that's what Heinz's camp, that's why they came out to say, to kind of refuse very specifically Doug, Mac, Doug McIntyre's report um, about the water thing. Like I, I took it to next, the next level. Like I wanted to find out like what really happened with the, the, the limitation of water. I was able to find out that, he was mimicking, uh, you know, match day access to water. Uh, it was perhaps not a plan that was uh, well thought out. And they they ended it. You know, like it wasn't this ongoing thing. And so I think that is where Heinz's camp is coming. And, and again, like no one looks good in this situation. No. I mean, it, no one does. Like. It's that's that's how grave of a situation it is for Atlanta United that, you know, the coach, of course, is upset because this is not what he expected. Uh, but everyone at the club, I think even the players that have been given everything on the field, though, but no one really looks good, especially the front office, who once again is, has has put themselves in this situation to have to find a new coach. So for Atlanta United fans watching, this is now the third time in two years that they're watching this club go through this. And you said no one looks good. Most of the people besides Heinze are still the same people that we've seen go through this process before. What, if anything, makes you think this time 
will be different or more successful? I, I don't know, truly, you know, because it's not like we're at the end of the season and they've they're the coach is moving on because he got a different job and they were successful. And now this there's like sort of a continuation of something. You know, I, I tweeted it yesterday because it came from Carlos Bocanegra when I had a conversation with him in the summer of 2019. Like he said that this club is constantly succession planning. Like I don't see that. Like succession means consistent results and and a plan so that when this coach leaves this is the sort of coach that's coming in when this player leaves we're bringing in this sort of player uh as the tactics evolve these are the sorts of profiles that we need and like so far everything has it has not been that way and so now they're looking for a coach 13 games into the season and and it's difficult to to to, to have a, the right answer here you know is it an mls experience coach well to, do, do, do you want this job? Like, do you want this job right now? Like in, in the situation that you're in, is it an international coach? Does an international coach want to come in? Does the club want to then manage? We need to get him in. We need to work on the visa situation. We need to get him settled. Um, we, we need to get his staff in place. Like all these things that they're going to have to juggle and ultimately make a decision about like, okay, this is where we are right now. We need to be in the playoffs. Carlos Bocanegra told us that on Sunday that the goal is the playoffs, which in my opinion, you know, if this is a super club, as Alexi Lalas continues to say, I disagree. A super club is a club that wins consistently, that develops players consistently. Uh, they may have begun as that, but they're not there anymore. And now you have a technical director saying that the goal is the playoffs, when the goal used to be to win every trophy that they were competing for. And so the standard has dipped a lot and that's where this hire is coming into like they need the hire to be able to just lift the bar a little bit get into the playoffs and then set the standard again and that's just like a difficult process i think right now for atlanta what's the timeline on this do you think it doesn't feel to me like you could afford to or should or will rush like, yes, you have whatever, 20-something games to get to the playoffs. But Rob Valentino, my guy, but pat you on the back, give you a pat on the butt, get out there and fix this thing, man. Get the vibes right, and we'll figure it out on the back end. But there's a huge amount of pressure on Darren and Carlos to fix it on the back end. What do you think of the timeline? Yeah, it's tough. You know, Darren Eel said he wants to do a quick hire, which it seems like – I don't know if that's the right idea. Like, again, they have very difficult jobs, like to begin with, like the front office members, but like they want to make a, a quick hire. And I think it's because they can't afford to punt on the season. They can't just say, hey, well, we're going to roll with Valentino and like whatever happens, happens. We'll regroup, which is what happened last year with Stephen Glass. It was like they were lucky to have Stephen Glass. He's a very good coach. But I don't think they were expecting to truly climb the table and make this incredible run. Now they have to because they, they can't afford to have another year like that. Um, you know, you guys said it, I think it was a tweet that like, um, you know, Ronald Hernandez, like, God bless him. He's had a, he's had a tough few years to get yes, to yes. today. Um, he's been playing really well, scored a great goal in Copa America, but Atlanta celebrating a tie against FC Cincinnati, I think tells the story of where this club is. And yes, the players perform well. They played for their new manager because that's what players do when the, the, the interim manager steps in. They want to play for him. Um, but that should not, again, that should not be the standard of Atlanta United to tie FC Cincinnati and celebrate like that. So yeah, the, they want to make a quick hire. It'll be interesting to see if they stick to that and if that's the right decision. I think we will collectively probably debate that once it's done. I know... Obviously, we started this with the Joseph Martinez stuff. He did some media this week, returned against FC Cincinnati. The con his contract, I believe, ends at the end of the 2023 season. Is he a long-term Atlanta United player? For now, he is. Uh, you know, my sources were pretty adamant about the, I guess you can call it a threat, that he told the front office um, that he wanted out, you know, after this year. He, you know, clearly he was at odds with the coach. I think he was disappointed with the project as well it's not just i don't like this coach get me out of here it's like where are my boys you know look around joseph martinez doesn't see the talent that he used to have he comes off a really bad injury and he comes back to this and uh so i think that's where the frustration was coming according to my sources on that now yes he has a he has a contract up until 2023 he revealed that again 
publicly that he wants to be here. He wants to retire here. He loves this club. He loves the city. I think he is very genuine in, in, in saying that. That does not mean that he will end up retiring in Atlanta. And it's comes with like caveats, it sounds like. I mean, right. as it always will. Like it's his career, his pathway. He wants to win. He didn't sign on to he signed on in the wake of like glory, not to have it all slip away. Exactly. And something that he when I asked him the other day, um, you know, how much change can a can an organization truly withstand before you fall into sort of troubling times. And this is a guy that was here when there was no facility. And he said it when I, t- I told him, like, hey, you, you were here before there's even a, a training pitch. And he was like, I was here before there were bathrooms. Um, and so that's Joseph Martinez. He is the like club a specific guy. memory. <laughs> uh, so he was like very specific in that. Like, I've been here. I've seen the growth. He mentioned the bad, dis- like the decisions that have not worked out. I think that was interesting to hear from a player of his caliber. Like there are decisions that haven't been worked out. Um, but, you know, we need to get back to winning. All the players need to commit. And so, yeah, to your point, Andrew, I think it's like a player in his position, uh, you know, it's, it's again, debatable where his value is right now. But clearly he's like extremely valuable to the league, to the city and, and to Atlanta United. And so if, I think if, for as long as a long term plan for Joseph, I think the project needs to be better. And like, I guess you could argue, well, this is what happens when you try it, when you put all your eggs into one basket on, on Joseph a player like him but like he scored almost 100 goals man i mean it's like or oh, by the way there are millions of eggs in other baskets too yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah kind of eggs so <laughs> we'll see i mean joseph i think for now i think he he wants to stay he wants to say it looks like he wants to stay um but it's we're, we everything we've talked about up until this point it's like so many things are up in the air it's difficult to see who is going to be around yep moving forward from MLS cup to chaos. That's what I keep thinking with Atlanta United right now. Uh, you're right, Felipe. This is not a super club in MLS terms or in any terms right now. And that's on the front office to go out and try to uh, return them to those days of glory. Follow him on Twitter, Felipe Carr, C-A-R at the end, not full name at, at the athletic as well. Best money I spend every single month outside of ESPN plus Felipe. Thanks for your time, man. Thanks guys. Anytime. Happy to be on. Did you enjoy that? Was that right up your alley? Well, go subscribe to Extra Time wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also check the full shows on the MLS YouTube channel right over here, and you could subscribe to the MLS channel right here. Thanks for listening and watching, everybody.